Good evening. I'm Derek Leroy, a senior here at Brown University and co-founder and treasurer of Woke Athletes. I would like to welcome and thank everyone today as we honor and celebrate the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Usually this tradition would take place in the Bellow Grand Hall as you congregate with warm food, laughter, and very well-dressed individuals. While the setting may look different this year, our hopes and focus on creating a strong, inclusive Bryant remains stalwart as we continue this tradition. I ask for you to close your eyes and take a moment and reflect on something that you're thankful for for the past year. Open your eyes. I'll share. For me personally, I am thankful for the support and long lasting friendships that continue to help me get through these uncertain times. I am thankful for the amazing organizations, departments, individuals that came together to make this event possible, such as the Multicultural Student Union, the, stu the Student Programming Board, Woke Athletes, Student Government, Center for Student Leadership and Involvement, the PWC Center for Diversity and Inclusion, and the Office of Institutional Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, Dr. Amir, and the Office of Vice President for Student Affairs, and also President Cattell. I read the behind the bio article about President Cattell in which he indicated if he could have dinner and learn from three figures from, from history, President Cattell would choose President Franklin D. Roosevelt, Barack Obama, and former NBA star Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. The first two of their roles in shaping history and the third because Cattell idolized him as a child and because of his dedication to social justice. I just want to say to President Cattell that I'm open for dinner any night that you have those over. But I know to do situations right now, you can invite me over later, President Cattell. Uh, Derek, thank you. I'll be glad to uh, have dinner with you <laughs> anytime, anytime, Derek. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, this is a very uh, important uh, event for Bryant University, an event that is in its seventh year uh, at our institution. Bryant has hosted local and national leaders who live the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King through their work. This year's event is particularly meaningful given our current climate and the questions our students have about creating a more just and equitable future. Dr. Martin Luther King spoke about the beloved community as a university that prides itself as a caring community. There is much we can learn from Dr. King's vision as we continue to work towards a better, more inclusive Bryant University. Thank you to our students who continue to make diversity and inclusion a priority and to the CDI and student affairs for their guidance and support. Special thank you to the student groups who helped to organize this very important event. The groups include the Multicultural Student Union, the Student Programming Board, the University Student Government and Woke Athletes. And finally, and most sincerely, a thank you to our special guest and distinguished speaker, Dr. Bernice King. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, President Cattell. Um, so to introduce myself, my name is Janai Perez. I am a senior here at Bryant University and president of the Multicultural Student Union. So this will be my fourth year attending the Martin Luther King Legacy Keynote. And I am especially thankful to be here today alongside Derek as your host and moderator. Over the years, Bryant University has brought many great speakers who have broadened our perspectives, challenged us to take action and inspired us to uphold the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This year, we are fortunate and honored to be joined by one by none other than a true living legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Bernice A. King. Dr. Bernice King is a global thought leader, orator, peace advocate, and chief executive officer of Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change, also known as the King Center. This King Center was founded by her mother, Coretta Scott King in 1968. And in 2012, she was appointed CEO of the King Center by the Board of Trustees. Following the tragic death of Michael Brown at the hands of law enforcement, 
Dr. King also led the King Center team in engaging educators, law enforcement, civic leaders, activists, gang members, and business leaders in the Ferguson community in dialogue and nonviolence 365 training. In an effort to build relationships between community and law enforcement and to decrease the incidence of police brutality, the King Center facilitates nonviolence 365 for law enforcement. The center has received certification from the state of Georgia to accommodate participants receiving training credit for attending the NV365 for law enforcement. Dr. King is a graduate of Spelman College with a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and of Emory University with a Master's of Divinity and Doctor of Law. She has also received an honorary Doctor of Divinity degree from uh, Wesley College. And Dr. King is currently a member of the State Bar of Georgia and a trained mediator. She is a member of the International Women's Forum, National Council of Negro Women and Leadership Atlantis Class of 2020. Dr. King is truly an innovative, energetic and committed leader dedicated to taking her parents' legacy and teachings, the King Center, and the work of creating a more peaceful, just, and humane world with Nonviolence 365 into a new era. It is an honor to welcome here today, Dr. Bernice A. King. Thank you, glad to be here. Denai and uh, Derek, I'm looking forward to the conversation. So, uh, to kind of just jump right in, today's present uh, presentation um, will be a moderated conversation with Dr. Bernice King. So Derek and I will serve as your moderators. And without further ado, um, if you're ready, we can jump right into the questions that we, um, along with other students here at Bright University, have crafted for today's conversation. So to start, um, Dr. King, can you tell us about the work being done by the King Center to ensure the legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and continued progress? Well, um, the King Center is, uh, has the vision of a world that reflects the beloved community uh, where everyone is valued, uh, respected and treated uh, with dignity. And uh, as my father taught the road to the beloved community is via nonviolence. Uh, and so our, our mission is to prepare global citizens to create a, a more just, humane, equitable, and peaceful world uh, through the nonviolent teachings of my father. So we spend a, a great deal of time um, doing education and training in nonviolence that we call Nonviolence 365 uh, because uh, my father taught it really as a lifestyle and not merely as a tactic to be used in the social justice movement. Uh, he felt that nonviolence holistically could transform our world and, and uh, could help us to um, improve and enhance uh, our, engage our interpersonal engagements uh, to create more equitable environments in, in our workplaces, uh, in our schools and in our communities. Uh, and so we educate and train people in his uh, principles and steps of nonviolence. Um, uh, we are uh, in mobilization and organization, um, and we're in the process of developing a whole um, um, platform around um, creating beloved community corporations, creating beloved community schools, um, uh, which we'll be inviting people to join us in the beloved community network. And right now, as a part of this whole notion of creating the beloved community, we have launched a Be Love campaign uh, or Be Love a movement. Um, and it is a, it is a uh, movement that is uh, focused on uh, justice from, from the definition that my father talked about. He said that uh, uh, power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice and justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love. And so amidst all of the turbulence of the times that we're living in now, uh, this movement is, is helping us to answer three critical questions, which are who should we be or who must we be? What must uh, we do? And then thirdly, uh, what must we accomplish as a humanity? Uh, and we're inviting people 
uh, into this campaign and into this, this journey with us uh, to begin to embody true love as a, as, a, as a means of creating a more just, humane, equitable, and peaceful world. Um, and to do that by building community, um, uh, choosing community, in fact, over chaos. And one of the things that we're encouraging people to do is to visit our website, um, take the pledge, the Be Love Pledge, uh, commit to supporting and connecting with organizations who are doing uh, the, the work of, of social justice and eradicating um, racial and economic injustice, um, to also uh, be a part of the effort to look at ways that we can create policies that eradicate hate and, and violence um, and the longstanding systemic oppressive systems that thwart our progress towards creating a beloved community. And so we're gonna be rolling out different elements as a part of this campaign. Uh, there, there's a lot of marketing that's going on now. In fact, right in Times Square, we have a few little um, advertisements, digital advertisements, be love, implement the demands of justice, you know, um, all different kinds of sayings that we have to, to grab people's attention that the only way we're going to be able to create a world where we all can share adequately and equitably in the resources of the earth, where we can fully live out um, our dreams um, and that we can live in just circumstances is if we are driven in our thinking, in our policy, in our engagements by love. And love is not passive, it is strong. Um, love exposes truth, um, but it does it in a way where it leaves people with their dignity. Uh, and so that's the campaign we're involved in now. Um, and uh, we will be having beloved community talks as a part of this. And you'll hear, hear more about that if you visit our website. And right now, in fact, right now, as I am doing this, uh, 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 our team of trainers is doing a three-part series of Be Love, looking at redefining love, because right now there's, a, there's not a, a real understanding of what true love is, unconditional love, um, love where you really care about the well-being of others. Um, and so we're re redefining love and having conversations about that, looking at revolutionary love, how do, how do we really transform uh, systems and people and then finally reconciliatory love. You know, how do we create situations where after we come through uh, confronting injustice and come through addressing um, conflicts, how do we create environments where we can still have a sense of community um, if we have to rebuild that community uh, or if we have to build the community that we never had. Uh, and so we will have these three part series over the next several months you can sign up in the month of March, April, May, June, or July. Um, and also you can look out for our beloved community talks where we are having these courageous conversations uh, about all of our um, racial differences. Um, and they, you know, they're very difficult conversations, but they're very necessary conversations. So again, check us out at thekingcenter.org. Thank you for that, Dr. King. Um, and I love the way how you talked about your father's teaching and promoting your own acts of service is it, definitely showing off. Um, but I want to jump back to last summer. Uh, last summer, our nation experienced a level of racial unrest that has not been seen since your father's era. And seemingly appropriate tribute was witnessed to thousands of people, white, brown, and black, raising their voices, fists in solidarity, and demanding the nation take notion of black lives do indeed matter. Despite the progress that has been made, the racist ideas continue to plague the United States. And similar to what we observed during the 1960s, millions of Americans had witnessed police violence against people of color. How can we reconcile past being very much part of our present and future? So something I shared with you all earlier before we started this, this program, my mother said, struggle is a never ending process. Freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. Um, part of the reason that it's, it, is, it seems or it is as if our past has spilled over into our future is because we lost a lot of ground between my father's assassination um, and now because so many people were 
consumed in individualistic pursuits and not understanding that we all collectively have a calling into the freedom struggle. Every generation has a calling to contribute to the freedom struggle. Um, <clears throat> that freedom is not just automatic. It, it's, it's not a destiny that we're gonna arrive at. We're gonna continue to wrestle with, you know, because there's gonna always be these forces in our universe of evil and, and forces of darkness that will work against our, our progress. And so we have to be very vigilant and so in order now to really reconcile where we are, part of the biggest um, lift is gonna be uh, going through this whole truth telling process. You know, we've all been miseducated about um, our, our nation, about slavery, about Jim Crowism, about who black people really are, the things that we have contributed to this, this country. Um, and there has to be a massive re-education of people. And part of that is the ability to set up these commissions that I know Congresswoman Barbara Lee has introduced into Congress, where people can come forward and talk about their experiences with racial oppression, racial, racialized violence, um, and uh, that we can come to terms with that, that there's a, there's a reckoning with that. Um, and then what is it that we put in place going forward in the forms of, of reparation, not necessarily just a check to um, uh, descendants of, of slaves, but what systems, or not even like systems, I think we need to do away with systems, mm -hmm. but what provisions can we make to ensure that we are overcoming the, the, the many racial disparities and economic disparities that exist um, in, in our country? And so there's a lot of hard work to do now and a reckoning to do that, you know, this is not just one bad apple situation. You know, if we just weed out a few bad apples, you know, our world will be okay. No, we have created systems and structures that create racialized outcomes um, that continue to hold back a whole race of people. When you look across every spectrum of American life, African Americans are still at the bottom. We're still last. Um, we still have twice the bad and half the good. Um, and, and so we're going to have to be vigilant. And remember this, because this is my challenge to everybody. Join me in this one thing. I, uh, I really uh, agree with most, if not everything, that my father has said and taught. But there's this one thing that he said that I'm on a mission to disprove. And it is this statement. He said, one of the tragedies still of human history. Now, think about this. He said he's been gone for 53 years. So 53 years later, this is what he said 53 years ago, and it still holds true. One of the tra tragedies still of human history is that the children of darkness are often more zealous and determined than the children of light. Darkness People who are intent on doing unjust things, evil things, um, or who end up doing those things, because I don't think people, I don't think a lot of people, there's some people do, but I don't think a lot of people wake up every day and say, hey, I'm going to be evil today. Um, you know, there are things that have outcomes that, that are evil because of some things that have happened to people as they've been processed through life. But the, the fact of the matter is, that the people, the people who do wake up with this agenda, it's almost as if they are organized. Uh, they work overtime. But then those of us in the light, children of light seem to be a more lackadaisical. We kind of take our time through stuff. We don't have the same sense of urgency um, and, and, and determination and zeal and stick to itness. And so if we are going to reconcile, we're going to have to have that kind of stick to itness, and we're going to have to focus our energy and efforts on a daily basis toward eradicating what my father called the triple evils of poverty, racism, and militarism. Thank you for sharing that. It's, it, makes, it makes me think about back in the day when I used to go to church, I just want to jump up and shout. <laughs> <laughs> hey! But, hey, hey. <laughs> but thank you so much. So in your experience, I know that you mentioned that um, it's not just the bad apples and it's 
there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, and we can't just take out these bad apples to get this work done. Um, so we kind of wanted to know um, in terms of us as a community and our allies, um, just if you recalled a time where a majority group uh, worked effectively to support the needs of a more marginalized population. Wow, I wanna tell this story that I heard. It was, it was so powerful related to the, uh, the Mississippi state flag that had the battle, Confederate battle emblem on it. Um, uh, there's this young lady, I believe she's a hip hop artist from Mississippi. And uh, she, she uh, launched a protest uh, against the Mississippi state flag um, and ended up getting a lot of hate mail, um, threats. And there was uh, one of the messages she received was from a gentleman that she had known from years ago. Um, and he said, look, I, I don't wanna see you die um, but I just want to say that I don't agree with you. I believe the flag should remain. Well, of course, she could have done what some people do, which is go back and forth and, you know, have an argument and, about it. But instead, she decided to invite him to her backyard to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And when she uh, asked the first question, it wasn't a question to kind of catch him, you know, like, I got you. It was a sincere, genuine question where she asked, what does that flag mean to you? So she approached the conversation from seeking to understand rather than to be understood. And it opened up this whole back and forth from him saying, well, what does it mean to you? And through their engagement over time, he began to see that she was more important to him than that piece of cloth. But he didn't do anything immediately after that conversation. But because of her approach, it disarmed him. And, and, and she was able to plant some important seeds. A year later, he personally took the flag that he had down in his yard, put it away, and he joined in the efforts um, to uh, replace to remove and replace um, the, the Mississippi state flag from the Capitol grounds. And just last year, um, the state legislator, uh, legislators voted to remove the flag and then the citizens of Mississippi uh, voted on a new flag. Um, wow, that was a coalition of not just what she did with him as a white gentleman, but you had Southern Baptists, Mississippi Southern uh, Baptists joining in that. You, you had the NCAA joining in that. Um, you know, white organizations, white entities, and white people joining in, in the, the protest um, to get a new flag in the state of Mississippi. And they, they had been through this for years. Um, and I think really, to be frankly, frank with you, it was the atmosphere as a result of the pandemic that slowed us all down. And we had to face what happened with the George Floyds, the, the Marta Arbery's, Breonna Taylor's and the Rayshard Brooks that really brought this thing to a head so that people really understood, wait, what black people have been saying and, and talking about forever is real. Um, and so the atmosphere was right for this, uh, to begin to, to happen. And so that's just one example. Um, here in Atlanta last year, um, we, uh, uh, we had hate crime legislation that, that came before our, our um, Senate and, and our um, House. And that hate crime legislation had been introduced before and it never passed. Um, and I know specifically of a group of several white entities and organizations because one of them came out of my Leadership Atlanta class and I happened to meet with them and uh, they were already committed, but I was encouraging them, you all need to get on, you know, on board with this um, because you have power and influence with some of these legislatures that we don't. 
And so they went to work behind the scenes and, you know, people like Delta and, and BlackRock um, um, Financial Group uh, all got on board and boom, you know, the hate crime legislation passed. It's unfortunate, and I must say this, it's unfortunate that it takes white people to get on board for America to listen and to make change. Now that has to change. We have to learn to respect the dignity, the voice of black, indigenous and people of color um, so that change doesn't come because of some white face or some white force. I sure hope the people back home listening because you said some good stuff. Uh, this next question I have, I, I, when I seen it, I got excited to ask you because it's, it's, it's definitely something that needs to be talked about. And, and I'm gonna go with, in the, in the most recent presidential election, we saw the power of black women to modify the political land, landscape. What do you what do you take on the role in the evolution of black women leaders in the civil rights movement? Well, first I want to say women have all black women have always been present. Mm -hmm. They've always showed up. Um, black women have really been responsible for for much of the force and the change and the strategies um, that happened through time. I mean, just think about Harriet Tubman herself and what she did strategically. Mm -hmm. um, to free herself from slavery and to free so many others from slavery. Um, it wasn't recognized and hailed the way it should have been. Uh, now we do, um, during the movement. Um, it's for the sake of all of the students, the movement, although my father is recognized as the leader, the reality is that when Mo the Montgomery bus protest started uh, and Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat, there were a group of women called the Black Political Council, who had already been looking for opportunities to wage a boycott against uh, the bus uh, company there. Um, and it just, it wasn't quite the right time when some of the others like Claudette Colvin um, was arrested. They were looking for how do we really rally the community? Who, who is that figure that can get people to kind of embrace it? And it just so happened that Ms. Parks was the person and my father just happened to be new in town. So he didn't have any kind of judgment against him as a person. And so all of these kind of forces just came together at one time and launched this movement. But it was the women who were strategically thinking about a boycott and the necessity of it. It was the women who got the, who were the, the, um, the, 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 the social media communicators at the time. They were the ones that got the word out about uh, the boycott. Uh, it was the women who were in strategy meetings, even though we don't hear about that. Um, it was the women who was providing, who were providing, you know, background support with the transportation system that they, they had to create an elaborate transportation system, you all. If, 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 if all of the citizens, black citizens at that time, close to 50,000, had no form of transportation because they were boycotting the buses, how were they gonna get around? Women were a part of that planning of getting them there. And so as we fast forward, we've been a part of every movement in the world, the peace movement, you know, the LGBTQ plus movement, you know, the, the apartheid movement. I mean, we've been, the women's movement that took place after President Donald Trump was elected. Women were raising their voices. Um, against you know injustice. And so we just don't get the credit for it. And now we have this vice president who is a woman, which has now elevated uh, the, the, has elevated us to a place where people now have to deal with the truth of the fact that women are leaders and they can be leaders at the highest level of our nation. Uh, and they, and, and, and they have, critical things to offer. In fact, I dare say what my mother said, that if the soul of the nation, this is what she said, women, if the soul of the nation is to be saved, you must become its soul. It's something about when women are in leadership, particularly black women, um, where people who are historically marginalized and excluded are brought into the room and to the table. 
and into the discussion and into the dialogue. Black women have been the most inclusive group of people um, in, of any other group. And so I'm, I'm excited about, you know, where I see women, you know, taking leadership across this nation um, in this world. And, and I remember I did a speech back in 2010 to a group of women um, business leaders. And I said to them at the beginning of my presentation, you know how sometimes we talk about this is the year of the woman or the, the decade of the woman. I said, I believe we've entered into the century of the woman. Mm -hmm. And I, since that time, I have just seen women emerging in critical places of leadership. You know, there was a video that went around on social media um, a few months ago that talked about all of the women who are now leading countries around this world. So, um, you know, I'm excited um, that we are seeing uh, more black women and, and black women, you know, the way we mobilize for the election, Stacey Abrams, mm. you know, it, the people who were uh, a part of the, um, the riots at the Capitol, unfortunately, they didn't take note from Stacey Abrams. When she, when she lost her election and uh, based off of voter fraud um, or voter, should I say, voter suppression, she didn't try to, you know, go and um, attack down at our state capitol here in Georgia. You know, she didn't corral people, you know, to get violent. She mobilized people to vote. And because she mobilized people to vote, you know, we know what happened with the Senate, uh, with, with the two Democratic senators. <laughs> Which sounds funny for us in Georgia, because we haven't had Democratic senators since God knows when. Um, and to have two and one of them be an African, well, to be an African American and a Jew. I mean, powerful. That's the result of the organizing effort of women, Stacey Abrams, uh, Latasha, um, can't remember Latasha's last name, with Black Voters Matter. Um, this is Black women. You know, we are very selfless in our giving and in our, in our movement uh, building. I'd like to thank you so much. Um, as a black woman, uh, we are definitely often in the shadows, but we do always show up. And I feel that um, there's a lot more work to be done and it'll continue to be um, the uplifting voices and actions of black women and other women of color that will see uh, progress today. So thank you so much for your work as well, um, helping inspire young women like me. Um, just in terms of how uh, young individuals like us can actually make change, I'd also like to comment on uh, social media um, in the age of technology. Um, so as we've seen social media open up new opportunities, um, both in how to communicate um, and organize activism, uh, with over half a million followers on, uh, followers on Twitter, what are your thoughts on the ability of social media to connect and build communities? I think it's an incredible platform and a tool um, that can be used for good and, and social change. Um, you know, um, I wish more people would, would really engage it from that perspective of how do I educate and enlighten people? We, sometimes we spend time in arguments with people. That's, that's wasteful. Um, you know, don't, don't use your energy that way. Put the truth out there and keep putting the truth instead of battering back and forth with somebody. Um, just, just, you know, let it sit there, in other words. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to let this sit here for a minute for you to think about. Um, and that's what I try to do through my social media um, is let some things just sit there. I try not to engage in too much, you know, back and forth because I see my role is trying to educate, to uplift, to, to get people to transcend the noise and really think about, you know, what it is that we need to do collectively um, to, change our, to change our society and to change our world. You know, those platforms are important to, to guiding us to other platforms where we can have like the conversations, you know, we're having now. Um, and, you know, on the WebExes and the Zooms and, and other places. And now this new platform with Clubhouse, which is even more powerful because it gives us an opportunity, you know, to use these platforms to really educate and enlighten like they did in the movement. In the movement that my father led, 
the reason they were able to be effective is because they had these consistent gatherings at churches uh, that they call mass meetings, uh, where they were able to give people updates on where we are with everything. Um, they were able to continue to educate and train people on how to deal with you know, the resistance and the violence that they may have been facing as a result of boycotting the buses, you know, to uplift them when holistically they may have come up against some obstacles, you know, when they were trying to shut down different parts uh, of, of, of the, um, uh, the carpools um, or, or they were, you know, just harassing people and arresting them for no, no reason. Uh, these were opportunities to really, you know, keep a sense of cohesion. And so, wow, we can use these platforms in so many positive and powerful ways instead of negative and wasteful and entertaining ways. I, you know, I think we can mix a little bit of entertainment, but I think we're in such a critical place right now um, that if we're not careful, we're going to slip into a very dark and difficult uh, season where it's going to be difficult for us to come out and come through. And so we really have to think about as a leader, how should I use this platform that I've been given? Because we're living in time now where anybody can have a voice because of social media. But do you just want to be anybody with a voice? Or do you want to be someone who can really elevate and influence people towards good um, and towards transformation. And that's what I encourage people to do. My father always said, leaders need to be concerned about semantics. And so even as you use the platform, be careful of the language that you use because language is so important. You know, words have denotative meaning, meaning the actual definition, and they have connotative meaning suggested meanings, you know, meanings that people have attached to them. And so sometimes you have to weigh, is this the best use of the word at this time uh, to elevate the conversation or to just fuel it some more? Because all that does is just add fuel to fire. It's counterproductive and nothing changes. I don't want to be a part of platforms where we're not engaged in change and transformation. Yeah, thank you. And I like how you said you want to be part of a platform that, and, and this is what comes from the next question is, how can we start connect a divided country like the U.S. today, especially where you see police brutality, riots, and political propaganda spread it all around social media? So where do we start at? Well, it goes back to what I was saying about that Mississippi state flag. Um, look, we live in this world together. Whether we like it or not, we can't orbit out of here, we can't fly out of here, we can't sail out of here. As my father said, we're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. And what affects one directly affects all indirectly. If nothing else, the pandemic has, has shown that to us, that what affects one of us is affecting all of us. And so, we are part of a global um, humanity. We are part really of a global family. And we've got to start seeing each other in that light. And we might have family members who are off base, you know, who are doing derelict things, who are doing mean and hostile and misguided things, who are doing oppressive things. But are we going to spend our energy trying to fight people and do a, try to get away, rid of people? Can we even do that? Can we really cancel people? Well, you can tune them out of your you know, individual platform, but they're still in life. They're still here. And are you concerned more with getting them out of your life? Or are you concerned about seeing a transformation for the better of all? Because you don't want just, like when we're dealing with these police officers, for instance, when people are harming other people, you do have to move them into other spaces. But when we think about moving them, is there a way to move them in a way that we still can make sure that we're sowing some important seeds so that they can be transformed? Because if not, they'll just move to another environment. That's what happened to Mike Brown. This gentleman was in another police force. He escaped that, came over to the one in Ferguson 
and ended up taking the life of Mike Brown. At what point do we put some practices in place that can penalize or, 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 or fit the, the crime or the behavior uh, with something that the person can have, have a, a, a responsibility and accountability for, but at the same time, you can put some important things in place for the transformation. Because again, as I said, we're just moving pieces around on a board. So we, that's why we have to deal with these systems and structures so that more people are accountable where they are in these police forces. You know, that there are things in place before we hire, that we're hiring the right kind of people. That when people are in law enforcement, that we are doing these psychological evaluations around trauma. You know, that we're ensuring that we're protecting against people who are part of white supremacist groups who are infiltrating you know, these police forces. Um, and we got to begin to do what um, um, the young lady did. Go into these environments where people who hate us and, and are hostile and try to understand where is this coming from? Check out, when you get a chance, Google Daryl Davis, black gentleman, blues singer, met with the Klan. He said, how do you hate me and you don't even know me? He started meeting with members of the active clan. And believe it or not, he befriended many of them. And in the befriending them, they denounced their association with the clan, gave him the robe, and many of them became anti-racist activists. Now, everybody's not called to do that. I understand it. Some people don't have the temperament. Some people just haven't grown to that place of of, of, uh, of understanding and discipline, but there are people that have the capacity and we need more people who are courageous enough and brave enough to cross those kind of lines because we've got to find a way, as my father said, we've got to learn how to live together as brothers and sisters or together we're gonna to be forced to perish as fools. And the only way I know how to learn is to seek first, as Stephen Colby said, in one of the ha habits of highly effective people, seek first to understand than to be understood. Don't always try to approach it as you're wrong, you know, um, I'm, I'm going to win this argument over you. No, try to win people's understanding and win their friendship. Because again, as I said, if not, we just further divide, further polarize, the temperatures will keep rising and we'll just be at each other. And that's not a peaceful environment. We need to win over as many people in the cause of finding a common win-win pathway forward to create a just and equitable and peaceful and sustainable and humane world. Now, I know that's not popular, <laughs> but hey, um, um, I'm sticking with it. I'm Bernie Say King. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right behind I you with it. Words, right. <laughs> um, I'd like to take a moment uh, to ask our audience if you have any questions. We will be doing an open Q and A at the end. So, if you'd like to add anything to the chat, now would be the perfect time. Um, but to your point, Dr. King, um, this humane and just world that you call for, and that I think all of us agree we would like to see one day. Um, and everything that's going around us right now, I'd like to know in your opinion, um, are you hopeful um, in seeing where we came from, where we started, um, you know, where we are now and where we have left to go in the future? I'm hopeful and cautiously optimistic because we've been known to slip back, mm -hmm. you know, to settle in and get comfortable, particularly when, um, there's someone elected into office that we feel is the savior now. Um, and that's very dangerous. You know, unfortunately in the African-American community, at least historically, we've had a savior complex. We've always looked for somebody to bail us out. And so from this perspective, I can appreciate your generation's um, 
focused on decentralized leadership, but challenge you in that as well, because in decentralized leadership, you don't ever want to decentralize communication. You want to centralize communication and messaging so that people cannot um, hijack your messaging um, as what really unfortunately occurred with, with uh, Colin Kaepernick uh, and President Trump um, because there were not enough people who really rallied around with a centralized consistent message as to what Colin was doing. And so you had this loud Twitter voice you know, talking about he's, you know, protesting the flag. Um, and it missed the whole issue. Um, but that was, he intended to do that. But that's why it's so important as we move forward when we're dealing with all of these issues that we have centralized messages. So I'm, I'm hopeful because I've seen the, the, what I call a new great awakening um, in, this, in this country. I have never, ever, ever, ever seen as many people from all walks of life engaging and really wrestling with how do we create equity uh, in society? How do we create justice in society? And so many white voices who are really looking in that mirror and confronting their white privilege. Um, should it be more, of course, do we have a lot of work in that regard? Yes. Or is there still a lot of growth and development and things that, that the white community has to learn around privilege? Yes, indeed. But the fact that they are now talking about it and the fact that corporations are now making some serious commitments, and I know it because I've been working in, with or either connected to some of these corporations, like here in Atlanta, our Atlanta Chamber of Commerce, has come together uh, with this um, racial uh, equity plan. Um, and it's a collective effort on behalf of the corporate community that has never happened in the history of Atlanta to deal with issues of corporate policy around racial equity, um, inclusive economics, uh, which, which includes investing in black businesses. They're gonna be very intentional about making sure there's capital for black businesses. Um, and doing it in a collective sense, not in silos. So these things are happening. When Coca-Cola just announced that any law firm that does business with them has to have 30% of their, uh, in, uh, their uh, partners, their associates, their, their uh, paralegals be a part of these different diverse groups from uh, Black, Asian, Latino, LBGTP, LGBTQ plus 30% has to represent those communities, but 50% of those have to be black. And, and if not, we're not gonna pay the full bill. <laughs> and then say that, you know, eventually we're gonna switch to 50%, but 50% of those must be black too. I mean, things are happening, but again, we can't sleep on it. We can't get excited about it. We got to keep pressure on. We got to be persistent. We got to be diligent. But I'm, I'm, I'm extremely hopeful. And you all have made it um, easy in that sense as well, because this generation of young people have not let up. You know, I've, you know. I've seen moments and times where, you know, there are these fits and starts. But over the last like seven, eight years or so ago, there's just been this continual momentum. And it's just been building and building and building. And it's because you as a generation are more collectively focused on addressing social justice in a way that previous generations want except during my father's time. And so, yes, I'm extremely hopeful because look what they did. And now that y'all are engaged, because change doesn't happen until, until you all get engaged. And, and it just doesn't, you know, we'll be spinning our wheels. 
All right, say thank you once again. This has been great. And I just want to move to the next portion of our program is the Q&A. And we've been getting questions flying in because you're a star, obviously. <laughs> and um, the first question that we have from one of our students is, you talk a, you talk a lot about racism and miseducation for, of America today. How do you think schools, universities should start changing their approach of the way these subjects in history are taught? You know, I, I really think it needs to be a collective effort. I mean, at this point, we're at a place where change has to come from, the, from a representation of the collective group of people in that environment. Um, it can't come from the top down. And it shouldn't be that the, the people who are not in those top positions have to be the ones, you know, putting all the stress and the pressure on it for them to do what's right. It needs to be, look, this is a collective challenge. This is a collective problem. This is a collective issue. And therefore we must have a collective approach. And so from representatives of all parts of a campus, a school um, coming together and having like, like the uh, Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce, they had a number of meetings and conversations with all stakeholders. So building together what the solution is, how are we going to begin to ensure that we are teaching history holistically at our university? You know, what does that look like? What are, what are the textbooks look like? What, is the, what do the courses look like? You know, um, but it's gonna take everybody being a part of that building out, so to speak. And so I think that's the real solution. Um, otherwise we're gonna do what we always done. We make a fuss, make some noise and get some token changes. That's not the way it needs to be done. All right. Um, to follow that question, it says, what role do you see college students having in the movement? You know, as I said before, things don't get cranked up and started until, until you all are you're, you're all a part of it. You have the energy, um, you have the creativity, the innovation, um, and um, it's the world that you you you're gonna live in. And so uh, I see you all taking a leadership in terms of helping to really define those issues that are important for the sustainability of our future. Um, and um, again, um, you know, not letting up. I have to keep saying that because it's easy to kind of go back to what, you know, the norm is, it's easy to kind of get caught back up in your own individual pursuits. But um, where we are right now, um, we are um, we're in a very delicate place, and um, it, it, you know the tempers. The I mean, the temperature is, is very high. Uh, a lot of anger, a lot of fear, a lot of bitterness, a lot of rage. Um, and I think if, if you all can mobilize and organize around an agenda, whether it's a one, a 2.3 point, 4.5 point, point agenda um, and get others to buy into it, I, I think we can see tremendous change. But I would say, don't try to chew off more than you can handle because these are, enormous problems. And when you tackle one big or two big ones, it gives you the momentum you need. The reason the movement got its momentum is because of the success of Montgomery. That's what inspired the sit-ins. That's what inspired the, the, um, the freedom rides. Um, and so you, you need some successes. We need some successes. I'd just quickly like to inform everyone that the night will be coming to a close soon, but we have time for one more question. 
And our final question comes from a student. Um, what is some advice you have for black women who are trying to find their own voice and power in a world that's constantly trying to tear us down? You know, the best, the best advice I can give you is to connect with other women, to find a support system, a community of women um, who like you are passionate about certain issues because that group, that community um, gives you the strength and the undergirding you need um, to speak out, you know, to speak up, uh, to become a significant uh, voice in society. Don't try to do it in a silo because you, you'll either be drowned out um, or you'll feel um, defeated when the negativity comes. You know, you, you wanna be surrounded by some other sisters because when, when we are together, we are, we are a force that's unbreakable. Um, so that's, that's the advice that I, that I would say. I mean, I was fortunate to have a very strong mother when I first started finding my voice in society. And, you know, she was my source of comfort, encouragement, upliftment, my cheerleader, <laughs> everything. Uh, in fact, when she passed, I told some people, I said, you know, it's a little bit different now. I don't know if I had the same level of courage now that my mom's <laughs> gone. Uh, so I've had to recreate, you know, a community of young ladies, you know, who, you know, are telling me, okay, your voice is needed, you know, and, and I know, you know, there, there are people out there that may not want to hear this, or they may try to drown out this whole notion of, of nonviolence, but not only are we with you, we support what you're saying, you know, we embrace it. So that's my advice to you. Like I said, I just want to, I can't thank you enough, Dr. Bernice King. Uh, every single word that you said has been inspiring, insightful, and supportive. And now at this moment, uh, this is the big moment I was telling you about. <laughs> every year at our MLK Legacy Dinner, we recognize an individual who has demonstrated steadfast devotion to equity and justice. And this year, it's my honor on behalf of Bryan University to present an award to Dr. Bernice King in appreciation of her tireless efforts in advancing nonviolence 365 and inspiring us all to work towards creating a more peaceful and just humane world. Dr. Bernice King, thank you so much. And if you like, you can say a few words, show off your award. <laughs> <laughs> Here it is. Yeah. It looks good with you, I promise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you all so much. I appreciate the opportunity to share uh, with your community there in um, Rhode Island from the from the south to the to the northeast or the south, again, the southeast to the northeast. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I hope that. I've said something tonight that has planted an important seed in your life and that you will continue to get it watered um, and that an in increase will come from that seed that has been planted on tonight. Uh, we got a lot of work to do, you all. Um, and, you know, we, we got to take it one day at a time. You got to pace yourself, but um, stay engaged. Um, make, uh, as, as, as Daddy would say, make service a part of your life, and not just service in the sense of, um, um, doing a service project, but serving humanity uh, in the way that you are willing to make certain sacrifices to, to create equity and, and justice. Um, because, you know, we, we've got to um, bring up and bring in um, everyone. Uh, there are too many people that are left out and left behind right now. Um, and um, we have the capacity to, to do things, we, you know, we just have to do it. Some of this stuff is as simply as just do it. Let's not let our analytical minds get in the way. Let's be led as we're doing in this campaign to be love, you know, and let love drive our decisions and not just our emotions and our ideologies, but love. What does love look like in this situation? If we're gonna create justice in our environment, what does love look like in terms of creating justice in this particular situation, uh, holistically. Because uh, as daddy said, as I said earlier, what affects one directly 
it's all indirectly. And I can't be all that I'll be to you all that you all be. And you'll never be all that you all be till I am what I'll be. So God bless you. And, and thank you again for this wonderful um, opportunity. Uh, thanks to your president and your um, the dean of students and, and all of the students who pulled this, this program together and inviting me to share with you uh, virtually as a part of the Bryant University community. Thank you so much. It was an absolute honor to have you here today, Dr. King. Um, we are so grateful to have you join us. I believe I can speak for myself as well as all of those at home that I will definitely leave tonight feeling empowered and quite enriched by your words. Um, I know that in such a progressive era hit with trying times, um, mm. our generation often feels ready to ignite revolution, but we get lost in how to execute the vision. Um, but I feel tonight's inspiring conversation will help us at Bryant University uh, continue to develop and take uh, your innovative ideas and work to transform our own community. Um, I also want to note that your message that love um, is quite the powerful tool um, will help us at Bryant um, because the more united we are, the better we can be in spreading great change on this campus. So thank you again so very much. Thank you. I'd again like to thank all of the wonderful organizations um, that made tonight possible. And also a special thank you to Maylee Koo and Jordan Cruz for helping us student leaders organize tonight's program. Um, and of course, for those of you at home tuning in, thank you so much for watching today's webinar. Um, it has been a lovely conversation, Dr. King. Thank you so much.